Well, good morning, Oakwood. Glad that you're here this morning as we continue in our series called Potential. Have you been with us uh, for the past uh, four weeks? This is part five, and the title of today's message is Made for Times of Crisis. Made for Times of Crisis. You know, we've been in this series, and I think it's exciting. I, I'm, I'm excited. I just love potential. I love the idea of potential. Um, that, that God can do something more than what we expect, something more than what we can imagine, that we as people want to be a people of potential, that we want to see God's movement in our lives, that we feel most fulfilled when God is doing something and when we are being used by Him. When the Creator is using His creation in significant ways, we find ourselves fulfilled. We find ourselves on mission. Made for times of crisis. And today we're going to look at how God uses people through times of crisis to not only bring about personal growth and change in us, but also how we, through crisis, have great effects on the ministry for the kingdom of God. Now when you think of crisis, I bet what comes to mind is maybe tragedy, or perhaps maybe, maybe something that is a threat. But I think a truer definition and understanding of crisis would, would mean simply that it is a turning point. A crisis is a turning point. A crisis is a, a point of force of a decision that we need to make. And for a believer, a crisis of belief is this point. It's a point at which every Christian has to decide in their hearts, am I going to trust God and obey Him? Or am I going to place uh, my own wisdom and my own interest above God's in my life. A crisis of belief is a point of decision. And in that respect, a crisis is also an opportunity to seek God, to see Him work in our lives. But all opportunities aside, a crisis is not without stress. It's at such times the strength and value of belonging to a local church, I think, is so important. The local congregation of believers is a family of God created to help each other in times of crisis, which we're going to see in the Word today. Many times God will use a church's support to really make a difference in a time of crisis. We've seen that this week. Um, many of you um, probably have heard by now that Clarence Heron passed away. Uh, we had a service of his uh, memory and to celebrate his life on, on Friday. And there was about four or five people from that, that very large family that made it a point to come to me and to say how much they were touched by the body of Christ. That how, how people in the church had just touched them. Just, you know, and, and some of it was you know, a prayer or a, a nice note or a nice card, but some of it was just hospitality. Some of it was just the fact that we made their, their family a meal so they didn't have that stress. They could just sit there and talk around tables and, and fellowship in their time of need. I think it's very important to realize the power of the church in a time of crisis. I think if, if we looked around this room this morning, some of you would say, well, I'm dealing with a crisis right now. I mean, right now, I'm in the middle of something. For some of you, maybe, maybe your crisis is just, has just gone. It's, just, it's over, finally. It's just passed. For some of you, there may be one on the horizon and you're just, you're just starting to see it. And for others, there may be one on the horizon and you don't even see it yet. But one thing seems to be in common is that if we're a human being and we're living in this world, we will face a time of crisis. But we need to remember that God can use a crisis to develop our character and to make us even more useful for Him. But beyond that, God can actually use us to minister to others. And a crisis can be an opportunity for God to meet the needs of some other people through us, which is a very humbling and awesome experience as a Christian. And if you don't believe me this morning, this is biblical, it's scriptural, so let's, let's look it up. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. If you have your Bible this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. You can also follow along on the Bible app under live events. Uh, you can uh, look up Oakwood Christian Church there. And if you're using the Bible that maybe is in the seat there around you, turn it to page 964. 964. And you'll be right there at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. So this is the second letter that Paul's written to the church in Corinth. And after uh, the first letter, this one's just kind of a follow-up. 
But it's interesting to see what he writes here at the beginning. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to begin with verse 3. And listen to these words. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. Look at verse 4. Who comforts us in all of our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort, comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. And if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Specifically, Paul's talking there about some persecution that was going on in his life. But there's a greater principle that, that expands out here that we're not only finding comfort for persecution, but we're finding comfort for our times of crisis. That when we come up against things in our lives, we have an opportunity, especially as God's people, especially as believers, to respond in a positive way. Because the God of the universe that brings, brings peace beyond human understanding it is the one that also is the God of comfort, the Scripture says. So there's several things that we can learn from this this morning. And the first one I want you to get is this. The person for your crisis is God. If you're going through something right now, you need to understand that the person for your crisis is God. I've seen so many crisis situations through my years of ministry, not only here, but in other ministries that I had. And I have seen God's comfort prevail in some amazing ways in some dire circumstances. I remember when I was youth minister in Clinton, Oklahoma, we had a two-year-old in our church that drowned in grandpa and grandma's pond about 45 feet out the back door of their house. How do Christians live beyond that? How do we make it through when we come to this time of crisis? And it was beautiful to see the body of Christ, to see other Christians that maybe had lost a child, to come around that family and to surround them, that they're still walking with the Lord today. Terrible circumstances. I've seen people stare death in the face literally with no fear. And the world would look at Christians and say, well, how can you stare death in the face with no fear? fear it's because of God of all comfort we put our faith and we put our trust in him he is our Lord he is our Savior he is our God and so we can face just about anything as long as we have him I've seen Christians go through financial trials relational instability and they thrive in even the hardest of circumstances and the world would look at Christians and they would ask the question, why? Why? And the simple answer is because they have the Lord as their God. The God of all comfort. Verse 3 reminds us that we can face any crisis because our God is the God of all comfort. Notice that it says, the Father of mercies, the God of all all comfort. What it's saying there is it doesn't matter what the circumstances are. It doesn't matter what, what's coming your way in life. I mean, Paul writes about this in, in, in other places in the New Testament. He talks about facing death. He talks about being shipwrecked. He talks about being tortured. He's like, can, can any of these things separate us from the love of God? Should, should any of these things diminish our faith to a point where we wouldn't believe in our God who is the God of comfort? You see, God is the person for your crisis. And I know there's many types of crisis. The, the first type that came to mind is family crisis. 
In our own homes, there's, there's crisis. Nowhere is crisis even more evident than in the family today. If there's going to be healing in our country today, then I think it has to start with our families. Many times a family crisis takes on the form of a marriage crisis or a parenting crisis. And yet God is the God of all comfort that will get us through those times, but He has to be your rock. He has to be the one that you put your faith in. And maybe if we expand it beyond the family a little bit, there's the community that's in crisis. The lack of morality and common good in our community is absent today. 25 years ago, people would brag that they left their car doors unlocked in their driveways and you never had to worry about someone robbing you. Well, you know that's not the case today. You couldn't leave your car unlocked for five minutes without it being put at risk. Our communities seem to be in a crisis like they were in the days of Noah. In Genesis chapter 6, at the very beginning of the Bible, in verse 5, it says this, that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Does that not just describe our culture today? We have communities that are in crisis. We have workplaces and businesses that are in crisis where people today, they only look out for themselves and not the common good of the company, the business, the organization. People today lack integrity and trust and they'll do anything to gain a leg up, to gain, to gain some kind of advantage on someone else. You've heard it said that it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. And it shows so many times in the workplace. But even beyond the workplaces, the national crisis that we're in. Our, our government is so corrupt. Our, our elected leaders oftentimes don't carry the same values as the people that voted for them. And again, it's a mess in Washington. We are in a crisis and it seems to be increasing and it seems to be everywhere. And you get to this point where you can kind of start talking faster and feel the stress of it. You can see all these different crises in life. And you say, what are we going to do? And God would say, I am the God of all comfort. And I am the answer to every crisis that you will face in your life. If you want to be able to stare cancer in the face, then you make the Lord your God. If you want to be able to stare any kind of health issue in the face. If you want to be able to stare death in the face. If you want to get in dire circumstances. Maybe financially or in your marriage. You make the Lord your God. And you put your trust only in Him because the Bible says that He is the God of all comfort. That He is the one that will bring us peace. That He will, is the one that will get us through those situations in our lives. And let's just acknowledge, church, that we need Him. And now, maybe more than ever, we need Him. So the person for your crisis is God. Don't, don't forget that, church. I believe that God uses people that understand this, that really take this to heart for special kingdom work as we minister to one another. But God is the person for your crisis. The second thing that you need to remember this morning is that the promise for your crisis is comfort. The person for your crisis is God. And because He's the God of all comfort, the promise for your crisis is comfort. Look what it says in verse 4 of our passage this morning. It says that, that the God of all mercy, the Father of mercy is the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our affliction. As I was looking at that word affliction this week, uh, it, it means trouble. But it means trouble and it takes on many forms. It's not just talking about one thing or another. It's just talking about trials and tribulations and tough times that come our way in life. And it says that God is the God of comfort and peace, and He can bring that in every circumstance. Do we really believe that? Then in any circumstance, that God can bring peace and comfort. Well, I've seen it. I've seen it with my own eyes through years of ministry. As I've seen people in all different kinds of crisis. They find that peace of God that surpasses all understanding. In Proverbs chapter 17, 17, it reminds us that a friend loves at all times. And the Bible says that we are friends of God. That God always loves us. In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24, it says that a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. 
In Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 8, it says, It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Why? Because God is the God of all comfort. God doesn't promise to remove our crisis immediately, but He does promise that He will get us through it and that we can find peace and comfort along the way because He is our God. So we need to remember, the person for your crisis is God. We need to remember that the promise for your crisis is comfort and peace. The third thing we need to remember this morning is that our God never wastes a hurt. God never wastes a hurt. Look again there in verse 4. What does it say is the purpose of our crisis? It says, the Father of mercy is God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our affliction so that, so that why? So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. It doesn't even matter the category and subject that it is, that we would be able to offer God's comfort to them in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Do you see it? God doesn't waste a hurt. You have had comfort through circumstances in your life, and now you have the opportunity every day that you exist in this world to share that with others. And so you should share. And through sharing God's comfort, you also get to share the faith that you have in Jesus Christ. The faith that you have that may even save someone's very soul when they choose to not put faith in the world and not put faith in themselves and not put faith in their ability to solve their problems, but put their faith in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's amazing what God can do. Because God never wastes a hurt. It doesn't matter what has happened to you in your life. It may be the most terrible, painful thing you've ever experienced. And God says, I'm not going to waste that hurt. I'm going to give you comfort and peace and there may be an opportunity for, for you down the road to offer my comfort and peace to someone else in their time of need. But because of what you've been through, your potential for the kingdom and for the usefulness for God actually increases. Maybe that's why the writer said, so count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. Because you're developing perseverance. Perseverance. And perseverance needs to complete its work in us so that we don't trust in our circumstances. We don't have to trust in our joy and happiness coming because life is swell and easy. We have it because God is our God. And we put our faith only in Him. Your experience of walking through a crisis with God just, just equips you in a very special way. Think about it. Some of you have been abused. And through God's comfort and through God's peace, He's walked you through that. But maybe someone, maybe someone even in this church right now is going through a time is still dealing with something that happened in their past, some, some type of abuse, and, and you're the only one that can really relate to them. God never wastes a hurt. Some of you have been widowed for years. And we've had several that have lost loved ones in the last couple of years here. And maybe, maybe through the comfort and the peace that, God, that you have found in Christ Jesus that God has given you, you can in turn minister to others who are widowed in their time of need. Some of you have been through divorce and you've been through horrible, terrible circumstances, but God has brought you comfort. And now He's asking you to reach out to that person that's going through the same type of situation. Some of you have been in financial ruin. You've been in trouble because of choices you've made. You've had health issues. And the list goes on and on. Uh, Somebody in our congregation, one of our senior adults, her name is Betty Jo Duhon. Betty Jo broke her femur just a couple weeks ago. Just, just fell awkwardly in her kitchen and broke her femur. And uh, when I saw her, I, I told her, welcome to the club. She said, what? And I said, welcome to the club. And she said, what club? I said, the femur break club. I said, there's only a few of us in this world. I actually uh, broke my femur when I was eight years old, 1984. 
And, and I tell her, welcome to the club. Has anyone in here broken their femur? Just curious. Anybody broken a femur? Two? Three. Welcome to the club, right? I mean, we're rare people here. Broken femurs are not common. You know, I, I got some pictures. Uh, this is me, 1984, in traction at Enid Memorial Hospital. Uh, they put a, if you go to that next picture there, they put a pin through my knee and put me in traction because when I, when I shattered my femur, it kind of went like this, and they had to pull it back. And so they used a pin through my knee to pull it back and put an ice pack on there. And I was there for 34 days on my back in that position. Happened June 1, got out July 4th, just in time to see fireworks. They put a big old cast on both of my legs, on the thigh of one and across my whole leg on the one I'd broken with a little two by four. You can kind of see they're going across. And then uh, the walker didn't work very well, so they put me in a wheelchair. And that's how most people remember me. If you were in church at that time, the kid in the wheelchair with the big cast on him. So broken femur. It's like, hey, join the club. We got something we can relate to each other here now, right? We got some femur people here. There was none in first service, so. You understand the pain. You understand why when you watch the NFL and they show the broken leg two or three times, you have sympathy pains in that leg. You know why. Because you broke a leg. We can relate to each other. Curious this morning, how many of you ever been hurt? Welcome to the club. How many of you ever been in a crisis? Welcome to the club. How many of you did God get you through it? Welcome to the club. You see, God will use these circumstances and He will bring us comfort and peace that we won't even really be able to understand ourselves. And through this, we can reach our full potential in Him and we're actually more useful to the kingdom because of what we've been through that we can relate to others. And that's how we can respond, and that's how we can look a crisis in the face and respond in the faith of our God. You know, I was thinking of, of crisis in the Bible. There's so many times where people came to this, this point of stress and decision in their life, this point of crisis. And, and I thought about Noah and the ark, um, you know, Genesis chapter 6 and beyond. And you know, there's so many stories, but, but the one that, that, that kept coming to me this week was Jericho. You remember the crisis at Jericho? There's this fortified city that has these great walls, and they're just, they're, they're, you cannot penetrate them. There, there's no way that you can do that. And God had a very strange battle plan for Jericho. He told the leader, Joshua, to stay calm. I've got this. You just got to do what I say. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to have the armed men march around the city once each day for six days, blowing their horns. The priests were to carry the Ark of the Covenant, blowing trumpets, but the soldiers were to keep silent. And they marched around the city once each day for six days. And on the seventh day, the assembly marched around the walls of Jericho seven times. And Joshua told them that by God's power, every living thing in that city must be destroyed, except for Rahab and her family who had helped the spies earlier. And at Joshua's command, the men gave a great shout, and Jericho's walls fell down flat. And the Israelite army rushed in and they conquered the city, and only Rahab and her family were spared. That seems like such a weird story. This crisis at Jericho, and what are we going to do? And you know what they did? They said, we're going to trust God more than anything else. We're going to trust God more than bigger armies. We're going to trust God more than the human strategy. We're going to trust God and we're going to choose to follow Him all the way because He is our God and we only put our faith in Him. And there's nothing else that we're going to do except to trust Him and to do what He says. And Joshua, I just can't imagine being in his shoes as he goes to the people and says, hey, we're not going to throw fireballs over the wall. We're not going to try to dig underneath the base of the wall. Instead, we're going to march in the praise parade for a week. And don't shout until I give the command on the last time, on the seventh round, the seventh day. And then something awesome is going to happen. You think that man needed comfort? You think that man needed peace? And what about the Israelites not knowing what's going to happen? And yet walls fall down when you trust in the Lord. You want to know what it really boils down to this morning? 
It's really just one question that you have to ask yourself. Do you really trust God more than anything else? Because if you're honest, you may realize that I don't trust God more than anything else. I trust, I trust money. I like my bank account and I like it being full of funds. Some of us, you, you trust other people. You have that friendship or that relationship. And man, I trust in that relationship more than anything else. I've got this friend and they always get me through. And Well, you know, I'm one of those people. I'm a self-made man or self-made woman. I don't need anybody, so I just handle it myself. I don't need anybody. I'll fix, my, I'll fix myself my whole life. Guess what? It works sometimes, but you're not the God of all comfort. And if you want comfort and peace in your time of trial, in your time of tribulation, in your time of suffering, then you can only trust God. So, I ask you again, do you trust God more than anything else? I mean, do you really rely on Him as your source of strength? Do you really believe that He will give you peace regardless of the outcome of your circumstances? Because you were made for times of crisis if the God of all comfort is your Lord and Savior. Because the Bible says that He will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus and give you a peace that surpasses human understanding because of the work that Jesus did on the cross. The challenge for you this morning is to put your faith in God and nothing else. You were made for a time of crisis. So choose the God of all comfort as your means to get through it. And in doing that, also help others as they experience the same thing.